It is hashtag Dato Thursday. Is that a thing? There's no alliteration there, like throwback Thursday, but it's Dato Thursday. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to preemptively apologize a little bit just in case some trenching is going on in my tiny little town in Wisconsin and my electricity in the shop has flashed twice this morning. So if we completely lose power here, no power, no Internet, um, that could mess up our live stream, but we'll see what happens here. So the agenda is to talk about datoing on the table saw. And I'm glad um, I'm glad I picked this topic because I see going into this, there are already some questions that people have posted. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer those questions first, and then I'll come back to my agenda of what I'm planning on teaching you. And then, um, of course, I'll look at questions along the way to see what else pops up? So, first one, um, which brands would give the best flat bottom cut? Should we stay away from a wobble type? So I saw that and I thought, well, this is a good question because it gives us the opportunity to talk about wobble dado heads. I own this, I never use it. The deal with a wobble head is that unlike the stackable dado that we're gonna use today, Stackable, you'll see it in a bit, is just what it sounds like. There's a bunch of blades that make a big dado sandwich, and that's what gives us the width that we need in order to cut a dado or a rabbit. With a wobble head, we put this single blade on the arbor, and on this blade, there's a hub. And by adjusting, by dialing that hub, I can change the angle of the blade. Now, I'm not angling the arbor, I'm keeping the arbor perpendicular to the table. I'm only angling the blade. So when this turns, I'll get a little closer so I can walk you through it. When this turns, it's going to swing through cutting that side of the dado, then the middle, then that side. So it's actually a single blade is sweeping back and forth across the cut. The good news is these are very inexpensive. The bad news is don't use one. Um, there are a couple of reasons. In plywood, like we're gonna use today, the cut quality from these is really bad. The cut quality being what it's gonna do to the surface of your material. This would chip the veneer so badly, you couldn't use the plywood. Um, the other problem with them is that the geometry of the cut is such that they don't create a flat bottom. So one of the things I always talk about is today's glues are stronger than the wood you're putting together if the joint is sound. So in the case of a dado or rabbit cut with a wobble head, because you ended up with a slightly rounded bottom, you don't have good glue contact there. So yes, they're inexpensive. Um, they're really not worth using for your projects. So a stackable dado head is the dado head that will give you a flat bottom dado. The particular one I'm using today, got to look at the number, is a Freud, is a Freud SD508. Um, and we'll, I'll answer some more questions, but you'll see that whole stackable business and what I'm talking about there. Then Norman asks, how big is a problem is a chipped tooth? Well, this one I have, you know, I chipped it wrestling. No, so you probably mean on a dado head. Any blade that you own can be retoothed. And I guess this could be retoothed too, now that I think about it. Um, the last time I had it done, it was about $3 a tooth. And they, it's just like what it sounds like if, uh, if you have chipped a tooth on a table saw blade, on a dado head, they take the bad one off, they put a new one on. Part of what's important with that is when you get, if I only get this retoothed, you should send the entire set. And this also has to do with sharpening your data because once that new tooth is on, they've got to grind everything to match. And you want this blade and this blade to be ground exactly the same, meaning their diameter, and the chippers that are the internal blades that are in this kit. So, um, Send it in to get retoothed, and he, like I said, even if it's only one of the rim blades, two of the rim blades, send the whole kit, and they should then match grind everything. 
Mark says, I'm having trouble finding a table saw that accommodates dado stacks. My Ryobi compact table saw specifically warns against it. Do I need a higher end saw? If so, what would you recommend? How can I tell if it will work with dados before I buy it? So yeah, you need to, um, you need to check the specs on the saw. And the bottom line is that with a lot of bench top saws, so that is you know what it sounds like. You're looking at the body of the saw. You can pick the whole thing up, put it on saw horses or a stand or whatever, easily carry it in and out of your truck. Many of those machines have a universal motor, not an induction motor. So bigger saws have induction motors. So as a result, maybe they don't have the horsepower this one has. It takes a fair bit of horsepower to drive a uh, dado head. So part of the, the way they keep you from using a dado head is the arbor on the saw is very short. So it really only has the capacity, the arbor is the bolt you put the blade on. Um, it really only has the capacity to accept a single plate a regular table saw blade, not the big stack like we're gonna put on. So you just gotta look at the specs on the saw and as far as like what saws to recommend, um, my default on this is always saw stop. You cannot beat the safety of the brake technology on a saw stop saw. That's not any kind of ad for saw stop. It's just the fact that saw stop makes really good saws and um, the brake technology could save your finger one day. So outside of that, you just gotta shop brands and look at the specs and see which ones will accept a dado head or not. And uh, many of those bench top saws, it'll accept a dado head, but only up to a certain width. So on this one, on a full size saw, we can probably go to 13 16 the full capacity of that stackable dado, where on a bench top, it might only go to a half inch, and it will say that in the information about that tool. Marvin asks, is the precision of the data more important? Both. Yeah. Yes is my answer. Um, because, well, with the width, I'm going to show you how to figure that out. You want the dado to be flat bottom for two reasons. One, back to this is, or the, yeah, you're, when I have a flat foot and I glue it, I have full glue bond across the bottom of that dado. Additionally, there are some cases where the dado shows. So it could be that you're doing a project where, where um, it's showing on the front. You're not hiding it behind a face frame or something. Another example of that would be um, cross having joints. You've seen me cut those a bunch. When I put two pieces together this way for a shadow box. Maybe you end up being able to see part of that joint. So in in either of those cases, I want the bottom of that dado to be just a distinct cut, crisp corner, cut, crisp corner, cut. Not with any whoopty doos down there. Um, so I want the flat bottom and, and with the width, at the end of the day, once you sharpen a dado head, if this stack, if this combination of stuff gives you three quarters of an inch, the first time you sharpen your dado, which eventually you will, it's no longer going to be three quarters. It's going to be less because they all carbide gets removed when they sharpen. So, um, that's kind of a fluid thing that's going to change and using what I'm going to show you today you'll be able to adapt to that. Um, so both are important, but the flat bottom is very important. Um, Don says, I have a Freud 608 and it has never given me smooth flat bottoms, otherwise convenient and easy to adjust. Yeah, so I don't, I think what the 608 is the six inch version of this. Does that make sense? No, because this is a 508. So I'm, I'm not familiar with the 608. Is there one dado blade brand you'd recommend? Um, I haven't tool tested them. This is a, uh, a statistic of one. I've been using this Freud 508 for a long time. Um, I've had great luck also with Infinity's dado head, uh, CMT's, um, who else have I had? Um, those are the ones popping into my brain. I don't know the model numbers. 
Peter is in Connecticut, the Connecticut shoreline. That's probably a great place to be this time of year. Um, is there much difference between six, eight, and 10 inch dado blades? Um, six and eight, so the, the deal with um, diameter of dado head, in the 10 inch category, I've used one once, never on a table saw. It was a, um, it was a twin tenoner in a commercial cabinet shop. Um, and I've, I've maybe never seen a more intimidating machine with, so a tenoner, just what it sounds like, you could feed a piece of material horizontally through this machine and it would ten in this end and ten in this end. It did that by a 10 inch dado head above, a 10 inch dado head below on both ends. You change the spacing between them. So as this one, it, Cut, it left behind that tenon. Um, you do not, you never put a 10 inch dado head on a 10 inch table saw. You do a six or an eight. If you own a saw stop, you put on an eight because the brake on a saw stop is specifically designed for eight inch dado heads. You can't, you have no other choice. On other table saws, you could run a six inch. Um, back to the benchtop table saws, if you find one that'll take a dado head, when you find one that'll take a dado head, again, because of their universal motors, they don't have quite the oomph that this machine has, that an induction motor has. So um, that smaller diameter blade is easier to spin than a large diameter, than an eight inch. So what it really comes down to is when this is mounted in your saw, how much dado will come above your table? And for me, probably 98% of my data work is data work. So it's only three eighths of an inch high. Um, even on, if, if I could run a six inch on this saw, which I can't because of the brake, a six inch would satisfy most of what I need to do with the data head. So a six inch can work for a lot of people, but that's just your evaluation is looking at um, how high does a six inch come above my table? Will that work for the joinery that I intend to do? If so, um, the good news is a six inch is easier to spin and it's less money to sharpen because you have fewer teeth. So somebody on YouTube is going along with my tooth jokes saying you can get a root canal on a blade. Kind of, yes. So, <laughs> um, and then Dwayne says DeWalt has a saw that will accommodate dados. Um, and Bosch does too, it's like that Bosch 4100 or something, I don't remember the model number, but I know Bosch has one, but again, you just gotta look at the specs. Um, Patty says, I purchased an eight inch CMT. Is there a sequence for adding spacers? What a great segue, Patty. You asked at just the right time, because this would be a great opportunity to talk about what it is we're gonna do here and now. So here's, here's where I'm going with this. My number one way to cut dados into um, pretty much anything, but specifically for cabinet work, is to do it on the table saw. So where we're going is that you might have a piece of plywood like this. This is red oak veneered plywood. You have another piece of plywood, and we want to join them like this. So we're going to cut a dado. A dado is a U-shaped thing that we're going to cut. Um, just in the world of arcane woodworking information, if we do that cut this way across the grain, it's a dado. If we do it this way with the grain, it's a groove. So, you know, if you're ever on Jeopardy and you're taking arcane woodworking information for a thousand, maybe that's one of the questions. Um, so dados go across, grooves go in the same direction. Um, and then just another side note, because I think it's weird, is like, where did the word dado come from? Um, I taught woodworking in Africa with Peace Corps for three years, and that was a British, previously a British colony. So their woodworking terms are different than ours. They call this a housing joint, which makes way more sense to me. Like, I, I really like that word for this joint. We're gonna do this work with what's called a stackable dado. So I think at this stage of the game, I'm gonna get you zoomed in so that you can see what we're doing. While I'm doing that, um, one thing I'll mention too is that if you look 
where you are, if you look on the page where you're watching, and I'm just seeing, I'm just scrolling down. If you go, if you scroll down just a little bit, um, there's a plan there for an Adirondack chair. And what a perfect time of year to make Adirondack chairs. I have built um, countless, I mean, literally countless of those Adirondack chairs. It's a great plan, full size patterns. Um, so you can take those to like a Kinko or something and print them out. And with all the curves in the arm, with the curves in the stretcher, you get a pattern that you print full size, you lay it on your work and you trace it and cut the parts out. So it's a very convenient way to put that plan together. The thing I really like about that chair, unlike some Adirondack chairs, the butt, the seat has a curve in it. So there's a spot because your butt has a curve in it. And then also the back has a curve in it. So if you look a lot of, if you look at a lot of mass produced Adirondack chairs, the seat just goes straight back and the back is straight across and they're uber uncomfortable to sit in because there's like no part of your body that's straight. Um, so anyway, I really like that plan. Um, so scroll down just a little bit. You can grab that plan. Plenty of summer left to stack those in your yard and uh, keep all your guests comfortably. Here we go. Let's do this. And some of this. And some of this. Here's what a stacked dado head consists of. Very different from a wobble head. Every stack dado will have two rim blades. This is the rim blade. There's another one that looks just like it. One of the things that's noteworthy here is, am I putting these blades on my cast iron table? No! Set them on a board. It's possible just from incidental contact between the cast or the carbide and that metal, maybe you're gonna chip a tooth. Don't take the chance. So I always set them on a board, I'll set them on the fence, I'll set them on the plastic laminate table, which is over there. Um, I never set them on metal. Those are the rim blades. Additionally, you get chippers. The chippers come in different thicknesses. That one is a 16th of an inch thick. That's an eighth of an inch thick. There are usually a number of eighth inch chippers. So there's one, two. Notice the teeth are staggered there so they don't touch. We're gonna to talk about this one in a second. Three, four. In this kit, there are four eighth inch chippers. Now in this pile, I showed you that's a 1 16th chipper. This is a 3 seconds chipper. Today's plywood is commonly somewhere around 23 30 seconds thick. So if all I have, this is buying advice on dado heads, if all I have is 1 16th and eighth inch chippers, I can go usually from a quarter inch, that's using only the two rim blades, to 13 sixteenths, that's the entire stack, one sixteenth at a time. If I have a three thirty seconds chipper, I can build that all up a thirty second of an inch increments. On top of that, we need these, which are really, really thin metal, mylar plastic, they could be magnetic. They make these out of a number of different materials. These are dado shims. So you'll see in a second, sometimes the blade set doesn't get us where we want to be. So we have to add shims. And when I say really thin, um, this one is four thousandths of an inch. It's about the thickness of a piece of paper. So we'll add shims as needed to complement what we have here with the blade set. So let me think a second. I'm going to move this. Here's how we're gonna figure out what it is we need. I have to move these guys, setting them on my fence. Again, what we're trying to do is we're gonna to try to cut a dado this fits into, and fit means when I insert this into the dado, it slips in with hand pressure 
but it remains engaged. So I don't want to have to drive it in with a mallet and there should be light friction on it, light friction between those two pieces. So the question of the day is how thick is this piece of plywood? Maybe it's 23, 30 seconds, maybe it's more, maybe it's less, I don't know. What I've done to make this simpler is made this jig. This is dirt simple. One day when I had nothing else to do, took this piece of MDF and I built the dado head up to 23, 30 seconds and I cut this dado. I added an eight thousandths shim and I cut another dado. I added 16 thousandths worth of shim and I cut another dado, then another here I'm back to three quarter inch. So this, I took the time to make this so that now when I get today's plywood, that's 23, 30 seconds, does it fit? That's a pretty good fit. So what one would do is gauge, did it fit there? Does it fit there? That's a little too loose. Does it fit there? That's way too loose. Having this on hand gets you in the right direction to get started on your project. You're still going to do test cuts. So I'm going to build it up to whatever this teaches me, whatever this shows me, but you're still going to do test cuts. All right, let me see what I should do next here. I'm just seeing if there are new questions. Otherwise, we'll start building up a data head. Okay. So now what I want to do, here's what we know. From that fit, we know we want 23, 30 seconds. I'm going to get you closer to the act shown. Saws unplugged. With the rim blades, they are typically marked outside and or the paint is automatically on the outside, not on the inside. There is a left and a right to these rim blades. So this is my left blade. That's gonna go on first. Now we know we need 23, 30 seconds. So we will be using the three 30 seconds chipper. Now, I'm gonna raise the blade a little so you can see better. Note that the tooth of that chipper is in the gullet of the rim blade. But it's not carbide on carbide or carbide on metal. Then an eighth. So at the end of the day, we gotta build this up so it's just under three quarter. With subsequent chippers, landing in the gullet is a lot easier because this, this is the gullet on a chipper. So when I put these together in the saw, they look like this. So where am I at? I need one more of these. And you will always use the rim blade. Never stack this up. Um, without using a rim blade. You never use chippers as your outside blades. Now, when this one goes on, once again, I'm looking very carefully to make sure tooth in a gullet, tooth in a gullet, tooth in a gullet, tooth in a gullet. At this stage of the game, looking down in my saw, there's about that much arbor sticking out. With that much arbor, with only that much arbor, I can't get the arbor, if I put the arbor washer on, I can't fully thread the nut because there'd be about that much arbor sticking out. Leave the washer off. Go only with the nut. We want this fully threaded. So I'm gonna hand tighten to start. I'm double checking my setup here because my next step is I'm gonna put a wrench on this. And if you have carbide on carbide or carbide on steel, when you tighten it, you'll pop carbide. 
I know this because a friend of mine borrowed my dado head. He did that. Uh, that was a previous dado head. And then he had to retooth my dado head because he popped carbide off of it. So now we'll give this a little snuggicity. Now that I know the teeth are right. Now, dado inserts are different from your conventional blade insert. They gotta have enough space for the dado head. I set the height of my dado head if you've seen my videos, you've seen me do this 11 billion times. I set my height with a gauge block. So it's very common that the depth of the dado is half the thickness of the material. Three quarter inch stock, three eighths inch deep dado. And I just find it much easier to do this with bar stock than reading a ruler. And I'm all about easy. Now, we're pretty close to a test cut. If I had had, if my, if my gauge board indicated I needed a shim here, I would have put that shim between the last chipper and the rim blade. So that if it's not right, it's easy to get to. If the shim is in this last little layer, it's easy to take off the rim blade, add or remove a shim, put the rim blade back on, test again. On and on and on and on and on. So I got to plug in. When you do these cuts, you do a dado or a rabbit, you want to have a push pad, never just a hand. Um, Push pad's gonna give you better control, and if something goes wrong here, the push pad is next in line instead of your hand being next in line. So a little dust collection. Looking on the test, we're looking for two things. I'm going to sweep you over a little. It's very easy to check depth of cut. Grab your bar stock, drop it in the dado, daddy -o, and if that's flush, your depth is correct. If not, you can make an adjustment on the blade. So we're, we're good there. On width, we want to grab that mating piece and do this. What I'm looking for is this should slip in and it's not doing it. So just with hand pressure, by doing this, I should be able to push that in. Shouldn't have to drive it. It's too small. So now the question is too small by X. And I'm gonna say it's not a big X, it's a little X. So we're gonna open up the dado head and add a shim. So I'm unplugging again. I know the height of the dado is right, so I don't wanna mess with that. And I'm gonna guesstimate we're only a couple thousandths off of that not slipping in. So again, this is why I said at the beginning, that gauge board is great, but you still need to do test cuts, and this is why. Um, for whatever reason, we have just a little bit of variation there. I mean, like I said, it's within a couple thousandths of going in. So do a test cut and scrap and confirm before you do your entire project. Rim blade off. Don't set it on the table. Then in my shims, I'm gonna grab a thin one. That's four thousandths. I think that would do it. Just seeing, making sure what my choices are. 
These are thicker. Let's try the four. So I'm just slipping this onto the arbor adjacent to the last chipper. Then the rim. Double check the tooth layout. Hand snug. So this is a rinse and repeat now. You've already seen this. Confirm the teeth. Boom, plug back in. Very close. Slipping in. There we go. So that went in with hand pressure. That's what I'm looking for. Didn't have to tap it, didn't have to drive it. But once it's in, if I do this, they stay stuck. So again, my test, and this is true, mortise and tenon, dovetail, it's always the same. I wanna be able to slide these in by hand. But then once they're in, they should stay stuck. That's cool. So sometimes, so it took two cuts to get that right. Um, don't get um, frustrated. It, it can sometimes take three or four cuts to get that right, four or five cuts to get that right, messing with the shims. So um, don't let yourself get frustrated over that. Um, while I'm cruising for questions here, um, I mentioned a little bit ago, just a little bit down on the page you're on, there's a link for an Adirondack chair, one of the favorite projects I have ever done for WWGOA. Um, Full-size patterns included in that make it really simple to put the whole thing together to cut all those curves and very, very comfortable chair. Very comfortable, very nice plan. Okay. John says, I don't have a flat bottom tooth saw blade. Can I use a single dado blade and sneak up on a, on a dado for quarter inch plywood? So you could, um, you can use two rim blades, which should give you a quarter inch. If what you're saying is because quarter inch is undersized, the problem with only using a single rim is that it's not designed to be cutting on the inside edge. So the cut quality is gonna be really, really, really bad. Um, it's designed, they're designed to be used in a pair and the left rim blade makes the left side of the cut, the right rim blade makes the right side of the cut. So um, they're really not to be used as a single blade. When do you determine to use dado blades instead of a router or a router jig, which is easier? So one of the guys who's done a fair bit of writing for GOA, um, Bruce Kiefer, a friend of mine, um, he does all of this at a bench with a router. So my only line in the sand would be, he, he, but he never uses a dado head. For me, if it's a huge piece of something, if it's an entertainment center side, 
that's 23 and a quarter inches wide and seven feet long, I'm probably going to do it at the bench with a router because of the size of that piece. It's easier to take the tool to the work than the work to the tool. Outside of that, 99.9% um, .9 of my data are done here. Part of the reason is the ease of once we set the width of that dado, in one pass, I can make a dado for my parts. And that could be, maybe that's a bookshelf and I'm putting eight shelves in it. There's no such thing as an adjustable router bit, like there's an adjustable dado head. So you have to jig that differently in order to get a perfectly sized dado. We've got videos that cover that, uh, that I've done. Um, relatively easy shot made jig, you use a pattern style bit instead of a conventional straight bit, it's, it's another whole topic. Um, so um, the good news is um, you're gonna get great cut quality in a veneered material from a $40 router bit, where this is a, I don't know what, $180 dado head to get that cut quality. So there are some benefits to doing it with a router, um, but ease of cut, I bring my stuff to the table saw all the time. Neil says, are all or most data sets including the same number and type of blades? Maybe. The big variable is, does it have the 330 seconds chipper? And I would say, if you're going to work with plywood, buying advice is shop for one that does have that 330 seconds um, so to make it easier to get here. I mean, look at what would it, if we didn't have a 330 seconds for what we're doing here today, I would have had to go to 11 sixteenths and add a lot of shims to get to the point where we were just barely wider than 23, 30 seconds. So it's way easier when you have a kit that's got a 330 seconds. Can you use the miter gauge for extra support? Yep. Um, remote for the table saw dust collector is fantastic because it's sold with your saw and aftermarket. So this is aftermarket and this was like one of my best Amazon finds ever. Um, in my shop, there's a dust collector on my table saw. There's one here that is the central for this side of the shop, which is bandsaw and CNC machines. There's one over there that's my planer, joiner, drum sander, and another bandsaw. So with this remote, it's sending, that's the CNC dust collector. That's that dust collector. And then of course the table saw is this one. So with this one remote, I'm controlling three different dust collectors in here. Um, I will try to remember to put a link for this in the comments, um, but it's, it was not expensive and it's, I've had it set up in here for Um, Dave says, I have a jig with a 5 eighths bolt in it. I can stack my dado heads and shims to match the width of the board. I find that's much easier to do if it had 99% success. Yep, that's I've seen that. And it's another way to do it, basically, is you um, if you get your plywood that you're trying to match on a surface, and you just stack your dado head up next to it until the top of the uh, dado stack matches the thickness of the material, and then put that on the saw. The benefit of having a 5 eighths bolt in it is that it's, it, you're mimicking the arbor. It gives you something to stack everything on. So that's, that's another way outside of that jig that I showed you to do this. Uh, James says you can buy shim sets independently from the data set. Yep, um, some data heads don't come with a shim set, so you need to buy your data shims. So while I'm waiting to see if any other questions come in, don't forget that at four o'clock today is the monthly Q&A live stream, four o'clock central time today. So you can come back for that. That's the hour long, just open format of, um, I will try to answer anything that you ask. Um, and I'm very good at saying, I don't know when I don't know. Um, don't forget to grab your Adirondack chair plans from that link. It's a crazy cool download. And um, what else was I gonna say? Um, in July, if you're in the Denver area, um, Thursday the, I gotta do numbers in my head. 22, I think it's the 20th of July is a Thursday. Whatever the Thursday is right around there, 
I'm going to be at the Rockler store in Denver teaching for the day. So check with the store if you're in that area on um, exactly what time um, what time that's going to be. It's all going to be uh, it's going to be a bunch of stuff about live edge inlay like bow ties. Um, so a day of that. Norman says, can you recommend a good sharpening service? I use um, I use. It's a sharpening service here in Wisconsin, but one can ship their stuff. I mean, I ship my stuff to them, so anybody can ship their stuff to them. I just got to look up the name. It's KB, um, just the initials. K like K, B like boy. What's the K thing? K like kangaroo, B like boy. K B sharpening, Milton, M I L T O N, Wisconsin. Um, so just Google them, look them up, and get a hold of them and ask about shipping your stuff. So I've table saw blades, router bits. Um, they sharpen everything but my wit, and you are stuck with that as it is. Um, Robert says, shouldn't you measure the blade height from the tabletop rather than the insert, just in case the insert's not flush? If your insert isn't flush, I guess you should, but your insert should be flush. Um, you don't want to have a sag, you don't want to have a low spot there. So um, just taking the, um, taking that bar stock right off the insert works well. And then if the double check is, you're putting the bar stock in the dado after you make the cut. Um, that would be an opportunity to do another adjustment if you need to. Um, would you ever cut dados that don't extend to the edge of the board or is it better to use pocket screws? So dados are way stronger than pocket screws. So it's two different, that's an apples to oranges comparison. Stopped dados are very difficult to execute on a table saw. That could be an example where you're better off going to a handheld router. The reason is, if this is my, if this is my cabinet, these are my the left and right sides of my cabinet. On this piece, if this is the front, I can make this cut, get to the stopping point, turn off the saw with my knee, that's what's happening over here, turn off the saw, lift this off after the saw stops, and I've got a stop dado. On the mating piece, the stopped component is at the leading edge of the cut. I am not comfortable plunging onto a dado head and moving forward. So executing that, I, I've never done a stop dado like that on a table saw, because it would be, um, I just don't think it's a safe thing to do. So a stopped dado would be a good um, handheld router and jig application. Um, all right, I'm gonna look uno mas tiempo. And then again, don't forget, uh, live stream at four, Max has put the link for that up. Um, and then two again, um, July, I'm in Denver. If you're in this area, this area being Minneapolis, St. Paul, open house at my shop, June 17th, 9 to 3, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. So if you're somewhere around here, you don't need to contact me ahead of time. It's literally an open house. You can just show up. Um, there'll be demos going all day and just there'll be a lot of stuff going on. So that's June 17th, 9 to 3 um, here in Hammond, Wisconsin. Um, looks like, oh, Q&A Q is next Thursday. I'm so sorry. Oh yeah, because today's the first. Sorry, Max. Sorry, Max. Sorry, Max. Um, <laughs> I got my days messed up. Um, that's what I get for being teaching out of town for a week. The Q&A is not four o'clock today. It's four o'clock a week from today. All right. So don't tune in this afternoon. Thanks, Max, for catching that. That's why you got to have good people behind the boards running the stuff to keep track of my 
messed up brain. All right, I think we're set. Looking one more time. All right. Thanks for watching. I will see you for the Q&A one week from today on the 8th of June, not today. And uh, have a good rest of the day. Thanks for watching.